Hello everyone. In my previous video we looked at sentiment analysis, which is an instance of a text classification problem. In particular, we were looking at movie reviews, and I showed you a simple method for building a classifier that can distinguish between good and bad reviews. So as you may recall, the classifier essentially worked as follows. We looked at the given training set of examples of all reviews, and for each word we found, we counted how many times it occurred in both the good and the bad reviews. Then if you are later given a new review, you can simply check if there are more good words than bad words, and classify it accordingly. In this video, I briefly discuss techniques that can take you beyond this simple method. I'll continue using the movie reviews problem as an example in what follows, but keep in mind that these techniques are good for working with text in general. Alright, so how could we improve on this simple approach? Number one, instead of only considering every word by itself, you could in addition also keep track of consecutive words in an attempt to catch common phrases. These longer sequences of words are called engrams. So one grams are single words, two grams or bigrams are two word phrases, etc. If you only look at single words, you would clearly not get much out of this sentence. But if you keep track of longer phrases as well, you could imagine detecting that knock your socks off or only socks off is very indicative of a good review. The next common technique is called stemming, which basically stands for getting rid of prefixes and suffixes. If you consider these two sentences, our algorithm, as I've presented it, would treat the words liked and like as completely different things, and yet they are both an instance of the same word, but just in a different tense. A stemmer is an algorithm that takes a word and strips its suffixes and prefixes. So for example, watching and watched would both become watch. The stemmed word doesn't even have to be a word itself. For example, liked and liking both stem to just lick. You can find stemming algorithms around the internet if you just do a Google search. And then, you always just first stem every word before you work with it. Here's another common thing that people do. For many of our purposes, words like a, about, and, as, etc. are just simply useless. We call these useless words stop words, and you can also find lists of English stop words on the internet. It is a very common practice as a pre-processing step to just get rid of all stop words right away, because we know that they don't hold any information. They basically only introduce noise and can potentially confuse your classifier by skewing the scores. Another interesting way of making your algorithm better is to make use of linguistic knowledge. There are websites like WordNet that keep track of all words in the English dictionary, and clearly this may be very helpful. For example, it can tell you what words are adjectives. That might prove very useful because adjectives such as great, amazing, wonderful should clearly be more important in your sentiment analysis classifier. Also, you can find all synonyms for all words. So maybe if you encounter the word wonderful in your sentence, you don't only have to consider it, but you can also safely pretend that you encountered the words fantastic, marvelous, terrific, etc. We know these words are pretty much the same thing. Many natural language libraries, such as NLTK for Python, allow you to easily leverage all this knowledge. Part of speech tagging is another extremely common pre-processing technique. These algorithms essentially decompose the entire sentence into a tree of what modifies what, what is associated with what, uh, they decompose words into nouns, verbs, adjectives, and things like that. So for example, if you used a tagger on the sentence, I did not like this movie, you could potentially extract the fact that the word not is negating the word like in the sentence, because they would occur next to each other in the parse tree. Almost all natural language processing libraries have this functionality. As part two of this video, I wanted to talk a bit more about a different approach for a classification task, an approach I've briefly mentioned in my previous video. The idea here is that when you're faced with a test review that you'd like to classify, you can try to look for very similar reviews in the training set. Since we're dealing with words and text in this case, a natural approach is to look for reviews that contain many of the same words. So in this example, liked and pleasant could be detected as the same words if you are using stemming. And since this training example here is a positive review, we may want to guess that this test review is positive as well. This is called the nearest neighbor classifier. The idea is always to look for the most similar thing in the train set and predict the label based on that. What actually ends up working a bit better in practice is if you not only look for the most similar review, but if you look for some number of most similar reviews, say 5, and then take a majority vote between them to predict the label. You would then call that a 5 nearest neighbor classifier. But in general, we refer to this approach as the k nearest neighbor, where you always pick some k. So what is basically the difference between this approach and the one in the previous video? Well, in the last video we were given a review, which we treated just as a bag of words, and we evaluated the goodness of that bag based on the goodness of each word in the bag. Now, however, it's more like we're given a bag with words, and we're trying to find the most similar bags in the training set, and then predict them based on whether or not those bags are good. So note that one of the disadvantages here is that we need to keep the entire training set on hand. 
With the previous approach, we only used the training set to figure out the goodness of each word, and then we could discard it. Also, expect this approach to run much slower, because you're not just doing addition of goodnesses. You're actually going over the entire training set, which could be thousands and thousands of reviews, and you need to consider them all as being potentially similar. So let's go over an example of how you could actually use some of the pre-processing techniques I showed you with a 5 nearest neighbor classifier. Here's an example pre-processing pipeline. Pretend we're given a large training set of reviews and a testing set of reviews. First, we go over every single review and split it out based on spaces. Next, we usually do some cleanup. For example, we remove the punctuation, like the dot in this case, and the stop words, like the A in this case. And then we can stem whatever remains. So in this way, we can convert all reviews into lists of stemmed words. Now let's look at how we could compare two reviews. Suppose that the test review we are considering said, surprisingly funny movie. And here we encounter a review in our training set that says, funny movie, I recommend it. Now we need a way to come up with a score for how similar these two reviews are. You could imagine just counting the words that overlap and making the score 2 in this case. But can we do something a bit more clever? Clearly not all words should count for the same amount. What's commonly done in practice is that we assume that words that are very very common are not as important. They're common, they're everywhere, so they shouldn't hold too much information. In our case we could note that funny only maybe occurs in 10% of all reviews, and that movie occurs in almost 70% of them. It's everywhere. So when we compute the score, we have this intuition that if the fraction of times a word occurs in a training set is large, its contribution to the score should be low. And when this fraction is low, then it's not too frequent word, and its contribution should be larger. One way that this is usually accomplished is that we divide by the fraction. So 0.1 would become 10, and 0.7 would become 1.43. Looks like that kind of worked. But unfortunately, we're still not done, and we haven't thought it fully through. Suppose that these reviews happen to include a word that is very, very rare. In this case, maybe they both mention the name of the movie, Enigma. Then the fraction of times this word occurs in the entire training set would be really small, maybe only 1 in 1,000 of reviews. And when you divide by this, you would see that its contribution would become 1,000, making all the other contributions to the score basically irrelevant. So we need a way to squash these very large numbers and make them small. And a really great squashing function, as long as you're dealing with numbers that are greater than 1, is the logarithm function. If you take log of base 10 as an example, then if you pass it small numbers, they will stay pretty small. But if you pass it very large numbers, it will squash them down by a lot. This is the kind of behavior that we want here. So if we pass each result of division through a log before counting them toward the final score, we see that the huge number for our rare word will be squashed all the way down from 1000 to 3, and the other words will contribute a more comparable amount. If you wanted to squash things down even further, you would use a log of some greater base than 10. And as a sanity check, note that if we had a word that occurs in every single review, then the fraction of times it occurs is 1, dividing 1 by 1 just will give you 1, and then taking the log of that 1 will always give you 0. In other words, the word will not contribute anything to our score. And that makes sense, so that's good. Alright, so that's the method. So for any test review, you can now use this formula to compute the matching score for every single review in the training set. For each review, you find the number of overlapping stemmed words. You make very common words count for less. You squash things down to make sure that the very rare words don't count for too much. And then you add it all up to get the score. And once you have the score for every review, you can find the top five reviews that have the highest scores, and you do a majority vote based on the label. And as last time, I took the liberty of implementing this entire method in Python, and I'll be posting the code for your convenience on the website associated with this video. I tried to comment a lot of the code to make it easier for you to go through, and a lot of it is similar to the previous video. So as before, here we first read everything in, then here I made a new method that pre-processes each sentence and just gives you a list of words. It is here that you can turn on and off things like stemming, stop words, bigrams, and things like that. Then here we go over the training set and find the frequency of every word. Once we have that, we can process the test set. So here we go over every test review, and then compute the score to every review in the training set, as I discussed in this video. Finally, you find the top 5 scoring reviews, and predict the label based on the majority vote of those. Now here's the challenge for you. I discussed this entire method because it's a very common way of classifying text. However, if you run this code in our movie reviews dataset, you'll find that you have a 30% error rate. So one third of all reviews are incorrectly classified. The last method gave us only a 20% error rate, so this one is much, much worse here. By going through the code and putting in some print statements and doing some debugging, try to figure out why this is. 
Methods have their pros and cons, and for any dataset, you need to choose the right method. There is no silver bullet in machine learning. I'll give you a hint that may help you resolve this mystery. If our movie reviews were very long, containing many sentences or paragraphs, or if we were working with news articles or things like that, this method may start to become more and more competitive. So think of why that is so. So I hope you enjoyed this video, as it demonstrates a whole different kind of approach to classification. I haven't figured out what I'll do next, but I think I'll move on to a different kind of data set and techniques. However, I do plan to return to this later because I've skipped talking about a whole different mind-boggling approach to text classification, which is probably the most common one, and also the one that works probably the best. It involves using the vector space model and support vector machines. So more on this later. For now, thank you for watching, and bye-bye.